Great. Great. Right. So, right, welcome. so welcome. Another 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 this is call number 87. Right. And uh, so today we have uh, David from Pendulum. So David is a technical lead on the NTPD-RS implementation of NTP and the STA, I mean, stat time, I guess, right? Stat time implementation of PTP. Uh, he has a double master in both physics and mathematical foundations of uh, computer science and has previously worked on the cryptographic behind anonymous uh, credentials for, uh, help me pronounce this, what it's, Y I V I, I don't know. Previously, I am I R M A. As part of this work on M NTPDS RS, he also participated in the IETF NTP working group, contributing to the next version of NTP. All right. Uh, today's uh, talk is about basically sync your clock with memory safe NTP and PTP. And with no further ado, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, yeah, so just to manage expectations a little bit, I'm still recovering from a mild cold. If you hear an occasional cough, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, also, this talk will be about half an hour, I guess. Uh, if I don't get any questions, if you want to ask questions during the talk, please do. I'm raising on Zoom, in my experience, works reasonably well. Uh, so if you at any point in things unclear or you wish to go into more depth on a subject, uh, just feel free to ask questions. So given that introduction, I think we can skip this mostly. So yeah, I'm the technical lead of Stefan and NTPRS. I have a background in physics and mathematics. And I'm also actively working uh, as part of the NTP working group on NTP V5. So what are what do I want to talk about today? Uh, I want to give a introduction to the Pendulum project, deep dive into the project goals and how we uh, pretty much the project goal and how we intend to achieve that goal. Some of the design philosophy, dive into a few of the implementation details, not too many, um, but showing a little bit of the flavor of how things work out uh, given our approaches. And then also a little bit on future directions, both of the project itself, as well as a little look at what we're trying to do with an NTP v5. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So what is the Pendulum project? It's basically, it's two implementations, two, two software products, essentially. We have, on the one hand, we have NTP DRS. It's an implementation of NTP v4, uh, including support for NTS. So it's basically your box standard NTP implementation. Uh, the difference being that it's written in Rust and written mostly with a mind for security. And then on the other hand, we have StatTime. It's a library implementing IEEE 1588 2019, uh, version 2.1 of the standard. Um, and alongside that, we also provide a binary using that library uh, for Linux specifically, uh, which aims to be... Um, sort of a replacement for P2P for Linux for a number of use cases. Um, so history, uh, NTP DRS started as a project funded by the Internet Security Research Group. That's for those who don't know, the people who are also behind Let's Encrypt. And the initial aim was to get a memory safe implementation of NTP. So that time started around the same time as a knowledge building exercise. Uh, we initially started with the aim of making a uh, PTP implementation suitable for embedded devices. So the entire library still to this day is suitable for use on embedded devices. It's completely allocation free. Um, a few minor traders we have to make to make that work. But on the whole, that, that worked out pretty nicely. Um, these days we're, we're funded by the Sovereign Tech Fund, which is a, a fund uh, from the German federal government. And they funded us for NTP DRS and StatTime for NTP DRS. Our focus there is to get to production ready state, which for us means that we're at a point where we don't foresee any uh, major technical bugs remaining. We don't foresee any um, major changes to co either configuration format or formats for observing what the implementation is doing as an external party. And we also expect to, uh, to be pretty much perfectly forward compatible in the sense that if you upgrade our software and you have an existing configuration, 
At this point, each subsequent upgrade should just work. It's our goal to make it just work um, without changes on the user's end. Uh, we also uh, get some funding to work on future versions of NTP uh, from them on the NTP side. On the Statime side, uh, they fund our main effort uh, to get to a state where we can compete with PHP for Linux. Um, our quality target there is still a little uh, less uh, well developed. We're, we're currently aiming at an alpha slash beta type of state um, where everything should be functional. Uh, documentation might not quite be up to what we're hoping uh, at the end of the project. Um, but that's that's roughly the sort of expectations you should have there if you start looking into it. Um, so that's roughly an overview of how the whole pendulum project currently works. So touched on it in the history section already a bit, but what is our goal with pendulum? Well, our main goal is to get security oriented implementations of both NTP and of P2P. What do we mean by security in this context? We mean that it's resistant uh, to either bad actors trying to influence it from the outside, misconfigured uh, stuff on the same network, that sort of thing also falls for us in that category. Um, so basically resilient um, implementations in, in, in a broad sense of the word. This, by the very nature of time synchronization protocols, you can't achieve sort of perfect security. There's also always trade-offs between security and precision. Uh, P2P and NTP make these in different ways. Uh, there's also aspects of time synchronization that you can always influence. Delaying attacks are pretty much impossible to um, guard against. You can only bound them by checking around trip times and things like that. Um, our goal is to make it as safe as we can by default. So how do we approach that? Well, first of all, we work mostly in Rust. Memory safety is the goal we started from. Um, so that's one of our main focuses. But the other is, is we want to have really easy configuration uh, that, that's clear. We want to have safe defaults and limiting scope. So let's go into a little bit more in detail on how we approach these different aspects of how we try to sh get to a safe and uh, secure implementation. Starting with memory safety. So memory safety, well, we use Rust. That gives us a lot, uh, but Rust still allows you to write unsafe code. It just basically means that you need to mark it. Um, we have internally decided that for the most part, our core code um, should be completely unsafe free. So the main library for start time is completely free of unsafe code. The main protocol libraries and uh, main runtime code of NDPDRS is free of unsafe code. Um, for the uh, runtime framework that we run on, so we write everything in an async framework because that is one of the easier ways to get sort of the parallelism that you want in this. We rely on beta tested dependencies, Tokyo Mio. Whilst they do contain unsafe code, they are well beta tested and they're reasonably well understood. Um, so we try to mitigate risks that way. And finally, because we want to manipulate time, uh, we need to interface with the OS in a way that few applications do. That means we can't entirely rely on the Rust standard library. We do need some low level access to OS primitives, primarily around timestamping in the network layer and clock manipulation. Um, so we don't get entirely away from unsafe there. Um, and we've decided to mitigate the risks there by using, by separating that code A into separate crates, which are smaller. Uh, and then in those uh, as well, minimize the use of unsafe and mark it everywhere and thorough review when we touch that code, essentially. So that's how we try to deal with the whole memory safety aspect. Uh, so far, that's worked really well for us. We haven't had any issues related to memory safety. Uh, we've had one issue where a denial service could be triggered uh, by an out of band access. Um, but that, because of the memory safety design of Rust, 
Um, that bound of burn access was called by a panic instead of just uh, accessing random data. Um, so that's how we approach memory safety. Then next, what we use for configuration is we've decided fairly early on that we want declarative configuration. So we use TOML files for that. Um, our main argument for this is that we want to indicate the desired functional state, not how to get there. So it's not a list of commands that are executed one after the other. It's this is how it should look like, a sort of a stateful, uh, state, uh, state description. And the software will figure out how to start up to get that state. Um, one of the main advantages you get with this is you inhibit accidental overriding of earlier settings. So both Crony and NTPD, uh, as well as NTPSEC on the NTP side, they use uh, command-based uh, configurations. And if you use double commands in there, you might override earlier se uh, settings that you may not want to fully override. Another thing we do here is we have made our configuration clearly separated into sections. Um, this forces you, if you write your configuration, to keep related configuration together and basically forces you to write your configuration in a way that makes it easy to read, easy to review the configuration, which makes it easier to have secure processes for this. Uh, supporting this ease of configuration, we also choose explicitly to use as much as we possibly can to use safe defaults in our configuration. I'm giving here some examples on NTP. This is a less developed area of Statime yet. Uh, we still need to go over that there uh, for a larger degree. Um, but for from the NTP perspective, so this means that we're not acting as a server for unless you explicitly configure us to. So there's explicit lines in the configuration that enable server and state on which port it's going to be listening. Um, we are um, explicit um, with how we handle uh, ob uh, our observability stuff. This prevents you from accidentally leaking uh, configuration um, configuration that might you might want to keep private just as a defense in depth. Uh, and finally, there's just pretty much no way uh, to get implicit sources of time accepted by our software. Each source of time that you want us to use, you'll have to configure that explicitly. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the main principles that we can also use to just reduce attacks uh, surface is the limit scope. Uh, again, the, the most conscious decisions here are made in NTP. In that time, we're also still in the development phase. Not as clear decisions made yet. But for NTP, this means that we don't support broadcast mode. Broadcast mode is notoriously hard to properly secure, near impossible. Um, there's reasonable alternatives if you really want it through the use of DHCP and just uh, communicating explicit NTP servers over DHCP. Um, the same with symmetric mode. If you want to service to communicate, they shouldn't be doing that implicitly uh, because one of them has configured something and the other just decides, oh, well, you're a time source. Let's just go along with that. Um, so we don't support it. It's also n known for having um, session management rules that at best are really uh, easy to get wrong in an implementation. And at worst, we're not really clear on that. That might just be impossible to do perfectly, um, meaning that off-path attackers can either always or very easily, if you make a mistake, uh, start messing with your connection state and just keep you from ever synchronizing to symmetric node sources. So for that, we refer users to just use two client server uh, connections in both uh, directions and just use them that way. NTP v4 is still uh, standardized on an MD5 uh, message authentication code. MD5 is horribly broken by this point. Um, I guess I wouldn't need to explain that more. So we've just decided to not support that at all. Um, if you want to use a form of signing or encryption, 
Currently, we support network time security. Uh, if that's not sufficient and you want uh, some form of um, Mac, we have support for SHA-based Macs on the roadmap. Uh, currently waiting for someone who wants to fund that. Um, it's not a major priority. Uh, most use cases, NTS should be uh, the best fit in our view. So that's basically how we approach uh, security within this whole context. Um, so let's then dive a little bit into the more details. And since I work on an NTP implementation and clock steering is an interesting problem to work on, I couldn't help myself and I wanted to dive a little bit in how we do clock steering there. Um, so what we use in NTP DRS is a Kalman filter based approach. For those who don't know, Kalman filter is basically a statistically optimal way of combining um, measurements uh, together in a state, uh, assuming those measurements are normally distributed. And, oh, that's not what I wanted. That's not entirely the case for um, network, uh, um, for time exchange over the network. This does errors are not entirely normal. The same holds for the process errors. Your, your clock drift is not giving entirely normal errors. In practice, this turns out to not be that important. So from experience, we can tell that this is working really well. Uh, we're on par, maybe even slightly better than what Crony uh, is doing right now. And then we combine that with, of course, a normal selection. Does everyone agree? Uh, we throw out the servers that don't agree with the majority. Um, we might even... Uh, we do even filter on a minimum quorum. So if there's not enough servers that agree on the time, uh, we can also just outright reject and not uh, stay at the clock. And finally, we do a weighted combine of all the Kalman filter outputs. Uh, so they give us also a sense of how precise each of the uh, measurements of time difference with respect to the various servers are. And we use that precision uh, to do a weighted combine and use that to do our final clock steering. So, oh, uh, with common filters, it's really quite important to have reasonable noise estimates. Um, with an NTP client, this can be a bit tricky because you might be running on widely different hardware and it might be asking a lot of the user to make these estimates for you. So we just don't ask them to. For measurement noise, there's a relatively easy solution for the noise estimate problem. It's uh, we can estimate variation of the uh, estimate variation of the actual time difference uh, in the measurement through the variation in the round trip delay. Um, that works really well in practice, and you can also use that then immediately to implement a pop filter, um, which is useful on top of the common filter itself to deal with the really excessive round trip delays if for some reason a packet suddenly takes three or four times as much time to pass through the network which does tend to happen with NTP from time to time you can just ignore the packet and uh, quite drastically improves your synchronization process noise is a bit a little bit harder um, we work on the assumption that frequency is essentially making a random walk so the frequency of a clock each time step varies either a little bit up or a little bit down um, we then take a limit of that process and uh, basically gives you error estimates on uh, your clock based on how much this uh, frequency walks around um, that works really well, but you still need then a core parameter, namely how much does it really walk around. We estimate that through the likelihood of measurements. So if we see a lot of measurements that are closer than we would expect, um, it's likely that our uh, we overestimate our local clock noise, and we likely have a little bit more stable a clock than we thought. So we uh, start assuming a more stable clock. And the other uh, way around, if our um, estimates of how likely certain measurements are consistently show that we're they're further off than we would expect then we increase our uncertainty on our local clock 
Uh, in practice, this works quite effectively. Um, we've seen over the open internet precisions up to 300 microseconds of stochastic noise. Of course, it's over the open internet. Uh, asymmetry is going to get you every day, day. So you still have asymmetries in the millisecond range to deal with. Um, but you've basically, this gets you quite good stochastic precision. Uh, on local networks, uh, both are uh, quite decently improved and we see uh, stochastic precision to the microsecond level um, with a single switch in there and asymmetries of a couple of microseconds. Depends a lot on the switch um, in the case of the local network. So this whole clock algorithm, of course, is not the standard that's described in the NTPv4 standard. Um, that's in the current working group, a bit of an open issue uh, for the next st uh, standard. We're looking at just not standardizing how to do clock steering. Uh, in practice, it, it used to be standardized in NTPv4 because it was the opinion of the authors back then that to ensure stability between the various, in the interactions between the various algorithms, you really needed to standardize on one thing. Um, both Crony and us are now using different algorithms and there have not been observed any negative impacts of this. Um, so it, it doesn't seem to harm interoperability at all. Um, and the improvements, uh, the improvements both in precision, but also just an ease of understanding and ease of manipulating the parameters of this uh, filter, just make it worth for us uh, to go slightly non-standard route here. Um, so that's one way, um, one implementation detail that I wanted to highlight. Another is in PTP, how we deal with uh, what we call master only mode. Um, I must apologize here. Uh, we are still on the old uh, nomenclature for master and slave states. I know there's new nomenclature out there. I'm still not used to it, to be honest. Um, tend to make a lot of mistakes with it. And for now, I'm sticking to the old uh, terminology. Uh, if you're really offended, I'm really sorry. I'll try to do better in a year or so. Um, so PTP master only mode as defined in the spec. When a port is in master only mode, just ignore all the received announced messages on that port. As a result of that, uh, the BMC will always recommend master mode for that port. That's not always what you want though in practice because it means that it will stay in master mode even if there are multiple sort of reasonable masters there. Um, so what we do in our implementation, we instead, instead interpret master only mode as we prohibit the slave state. And we don't do anything with announced messages just yet. And what this does is provide us a little more flexibility on this point. Uh, again, this doesn't seem to give any sort of practical interoperability problems. Perhaps if you go into the maintenance management mode uh, side of P2P, this might give some confusion in certain contexts. We're not entirely sure on that. We currently don't have plans to uh, implement the management extensions for P2P. Uh, if you have feedback on this, we're happy to hear it. Um, the original functionality can still be attained with the help of acceptable master tables or master lists, I call them here, uh, by simply enable master only mode and then uh, add an, an empty acceptable master list, because that means that all incoming announced messages will be checked against the acceptable master list. They will all be rejected as not being on that list. Uh, um, oh, but you, uh, we can now also support firewall type of use. So a port uh, on a boundary clock can be used to provide time to the downstream network, never accept time, but we can now support um, redundant setups. So if we have a network A where we have our grandmaster clock and we have a network B where we don't fully trust all the devices in there, uh, for example, there might be configuration faults in there and we don't want that to flow back up into network uh, A, then we can uh, set up two boundary clocks side by side, both connecting with one port to network A 
I want port to network B. And we can whitelist them to, through the acceptable master list to accept each other as the master. Uh, so they don't both start shouting into network B at the same time. But they can still use the BMCA to coordinate between themselves. So if one of them goes down, the other one automatically becomes master after a little bit of time. Um, and at the same time, by setting their ports B in network B to always be, to be uh, master only mode, there'll never be a time flow through network B back into network A at the same time. So this is the ways we're not fully uh, compliant with the um, with the standards because of doing sort of these sort of things, but at the same time, it does buy us a little bit more flexibility and hopefully. Uh, provides more useful use cases to our users. And we actually have people who use this uh, or are planning to use this. So that's a look into what we do, how we do it, why we do it, uh, our thought processes here. Uh, let's a look into the future. So we're also, uh, I specifically and a colleague of mine are also working on NTPv5 uh, together with the rest of the uh, NTP working group. Uh, Miroslav is also a really uh, good contributor here. Um, so what is NTPv5 trying to do? It's trying to fix a number of issues in the NTPv4 spec. One of the big things is we're planning to do a full uh, revision of the loop detection mechanism. The NTPv4 loop detection mechanism uh, uses reference IDs. Um, it has all sorts of failure modes and not will interfere with it properly detecting loops. If you use multiple time sources, which the spec, even the standard algorithm uh, expects to do, it will not detect all potential loops. Uh, so we're changing that over to the current suggestion is a Bloom filter uh, where each uh, server has an identifier of about 10 bits. And we then use a 512 byte uh, Bloom filter uh, to check, uh, to keep track of which servers have contributed in the upstream tree of time sources. And if you're in that upstream uh, tree, you know to ignore a time so source. Um, and this turns out to work really well in practice. Uh, it seems to detect all sorts of loops. It also detects uh, intentional problematic situations. So if I uh, configure three servers, to just point at each other and let them fight it out. They will fight it out and they will stabilize fairly quickly. Um, whereas with NTPv4, you can fairly easily get time loops there, especially if you start adding up further upstream uh, time sources that sort of act as primaries and then they become secondary sources for each other. Uh, they might start oscillating, um, but they don't do that anymore. Uh, we finally added also support for multiple time scales. Uh, in particular, we uh, added support for uh, atomic time uh, as well as UTC. Um, atomic time should be uh, a big step of the, on the way to dealing better with leap seconds. Uh, and the PV4 doesn't particularly do well around leap seconds um, because the timestamps repeat around that time uh, just because of how everything is defined. Um, this also supports properly indicating that you're doing leap smearing, uh, which should help alleviate problems that we've had in the past with the Google servers, which do leap smearing, ending up in configurations of with alongside other time sources, which do not do leap smearing. And then you've got two time sources that disagree on the time by up to half a second, which gives all sorts of interesting effects and might cause oscillations again and things like that uh, that are unwanted. Um, finally, we've also focused on removing uh, some of the information leak paths that are still present in NTPv4. So uh, instead of uh, using the transmit timestamp of the um, of the client as sort of a token for what the response uh, in the response to detect the right response and to detect the late response, um, we now just specify that you should use a random string. You should already in NTPv4. That shouldn't be an actual timestamp, but we still see implementations that make an actual timestamp. So it's now in the spec 
um, we're switching to just specifying that these should be random bit strings, um, which hopefully will make people less likely to make uh, mistakes in this in the future. So that's what uh, the, our work on NTPv5 looks like. So what do we plan to do within the Pendulum project uh, over the next couple of years? What, what are our, our hopes and dreams of the future? So we would like to eventually get that time also to a production ready state. So similar to NTP DRS, ensure that it's fully forward compatible. You can upgrade it without having to potentially change its configuration. We're not yet there yet. Our current funding package isn't going to get us there likely, um, but it's our hope that we can get there. Um, we're looking at supporting local reference clocks in NTP DRS. So things like GPS clock support, pulse per second, uh, that's currently not yet supported. Um, we'd like to get some modicum of support in the near future, but to fully get this implemented it would probably take a while. And we would ideally like to contribute, uh, keep contributing to future protocol development. So walking the long road of getting NTPv5 standardized, um, I have long since accepted that this is gonna be a multi-year effort. Um, we hope to get there within the next two or three years. Uh, that, that would be my optimistic estimates. Um, and we're also looking to get involved in uh, defining uh, and properly standardizing some of the leap smearing timescales, uh, which is actually part of what we're going to likely need for the NTPv5 work as well. Um, so if you found this all interesting, try out NTPDRS, uh, try out stat time, look at them, read the documentation, report bugs and issues. It's always, feedback's always welcome for us. Um, if you're interested at all in protocol development or uh, have certain desires, feedback on uh, IETF drafts is always wanted. Uh, especially also from end users. We in the working group are sorely missing feedback from end users. There's a lot of developers in there. There's not so many people who use the end equipment. In particular, if you need a starting point, if you want a starting point, the requirements draft for NTPv5, which specifies a lot of what do we want out of NTPv5, what do we want it to be, not the technical detail of how we, how we get there, but what should it provide us, uh, is in there. Um, it's close to getting uh, to the publication process. So now's the time to read it and provide uh, last minute feedback. Um, and if you need specific features or you need to uh, or want to support contracts, uh, feel free to contact us as well. Um, we are capable of offering these kinds of things uh, if there's a desire for that. So here are some URLs for those who want to uh, look at the other things. Um, I think I can provide a copy of the slides later to Amit. Um, I'm not sure how that's usually uh, distributed, but uh, I can provide a copy of those it to those interested. On the, on the wiki. We sit on the wiki with, with the report. With the report. Uh, okay. Oh. Um, and if there's any questions uh, after all this, uh, please uh, Wonderful. let me know. All right. All right. Let's open Let's the floor, open for, the floor question. for questions. You just unmute yourself and ask your question. Anyone here from the audience? Okay, I will start with the first then as icebreaker. So, uh, I mean, it's great to see all this progress with NTP and uh, going like for NTP version five. I was wondering, like there, there, there are certain things that they basically are the source for uh, like less, let's say precision, uh, including let's say hardware time stamping or the lack of transparent clocks. And I was wondering, is there any, let's say, vision or desire to have, uh, let's say, at least adaptability for uh, things like that, let's say, in NTP version 5? And, I mean, ultimately, the question is, would, uh, would, would, would you guys be open to have, let's say, an uh, interoperable, uh, if not identical, 
to a, let's say, merging the two sides, like what PDP is doing and NTP is doing and make them interoperable. So use advantages from both sides, like for the benefit of, let's say, the end users. Um, so yeah, this is definitely a thing. Uh, on the precision front, um, and PV4 already allows the use of hardware clock, uh, of hardware timestamping if you want to. Um, and PV5 additionally will um, include, will will finally formalize something that's already sort of exists in NTPv4 called interleave mode, which essentially allows you to send a more precise timestamp at a later time. Um, so th that allows you to use send timestamping. One of the challenges with using that at the moment is that not all network uh, equipment, uh, not all NICs in particular, support just timestamping any old message. Um, it happens a lot that they only support specifically timestamping NTP, uh, P2P messages. Um, it's not entirely clear for, to me from a hardware design standpoint why that is. Um, I've seen hardware designs that support it fully, and they seem reasonably simple. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm guessing there's technical reasons there that I don't fully understand. Um, so that already exists to a degree. Um, um, to overcome sort of the, um, the, the hardware support problem, there's a current draft called uh, NTP over NT, uh, oh, NTP over P2P that basically wraps uh, NTP messages into P2P belay request messages, which essentially tricks the hardware into um, timestamping it anyway. And that means that you get a lot of the advantages of NTP, um, a slightly better security model. Um, whilst still getting all the benefits that our timestamping can give you. That turns out to be sufficient to also get P2P some P2P transparent clocks to work. Uh, you need unicast um, transparent clock support for that to produce reasonable results. But if you do, then uh, from what I've heard from people who've implemented that, uh, nanosecond precision is, is definitely within reach. Um, looking to NTPv5, we're also explicitly looking to encode uh, options for a hardware clock uh, and transparent clock support in the spec itself. Uh, so correction fields in the same uh, vein of those supported by P2P. Um, one of the things we are looking for on that point is for people who have experience with switch and um, hardware network hardware design, to look at that, look at the design of the protocol around that, and give feedback if that they're able to. Um, so if you're interested in that, please please give us feedback. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely on the agenda, of making it possible to reach the higher positions with uh, NTP as well. And there's fundamentally, there seem to be no reasons why it shouldn't be possible. So yes, so, uh, yes uh, from, 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 from our side, from our side I, would, I mean, I mean, uh, not our side. Not I mean, side, I mean, we basically, we basically presented a new work, a new work about, uh, SPD, uh, which basically we simplified uh, in unicast transactions, like all the, uh, the and then there was a, like a similar effort also from Mindberg. and there is also another like similar effort from Microchip. So there. This has been going on for a while. That's like you have all this uh, sophistication that you have, like in different profiles of PDP, but you don't necessarily need a lot of it. Let's say in um, in a unicast applications, specifically when you have a coherent network and you're trying to uh, sync with a local uh, time source, and um, it, it it looks to me like is, is got, like in terms of message exchange, it can get boiled down to let's say simply two messages one going forward going backwards so you have two two equations two unknowns and get the whole thing solved and um, no it's not prone to like you know intermittent errors or something because it still has a servo and has the integral part so it's going to take care of that so 
uh, it's just like uh, the messaging, uh, whatever. Like it, it, it starts to starts to look more like NTP, and I'd love to see like some convergence of the two, at least if not in the beginning convergence. Let's call it interoperability. Let's say you have, I mean, I didn't know, I was not aware of like wrapping uh, NTP messages into PTP. I mean, I don't see a difference, and I'll call it PTP because <laughs> it all goes with the hardware time something. But but it's great, you know. Like I like to see more of these things rather than two parties trying to do the same thing in parallel and all the like. And then you you end up as as customers. I'm more of a customer here, ending up be, between like ah, oh, it would have been great if I had this part of that on this one, and like like basically aiming for a Frankenstein. I rather have everything in the in one place, like one protocol that works like for uh, all the all the needs. So all right, let's see all anyone right, let's see any more questions. That was all my icebreaker. So let's see. <laughs> David, maybe again you can uh, speak more on that wrapper, or uh, like put NTP in, in PTP format. Yeah, so it, it's essentially it, it's it's really the the most simple and stupid solution you could think of. So it essentially takes a PTP delay a request message um, and adds an extra TLV. Um, that contains the actual entity message that we're trying to pass between client and server. And what that does is it tricks all the hardware in the intermediate chain. So uh, both in the network cards and in any transparent clocks on the way, um, tricks it into treating it just like a normal delay request um, message, which means it gets all the special timestamp uh, treatments, uh, gets the correction field properly set, um, which means that at the end of the road, you get your NTP message, but you also get your corrections. The sender of it uh, gets to know a precise send timestamp uh, if it wants that, uh, which it can then send along later uh, if it wants to do that, uh, if it wants to support that. Um, and the advantages on top of that is that you basically get the whole NTS mechanism uh, can, can work seamlessly with this. Uh, so you can use MTS, which is a fairly, at this point, reasonably solid and mature security solution with a well-understood uh, failure modes as well. Um, um, so it basically provides you with sort of the best of both worlds, the hardware support, the P2P, uh, with the, the somewhat more solid security model uh, of NTP. So one of the problems with P2P and the P2P message shining is that there's a number of messages which are in most sense mostly broadcast. That gives you a lack of uh, randomness that is generated by the receiver on the server end, um, which can lead to uh, susceptibility to replay attacks. NTS doesn't have that, uh, primarily because it's still a client server protocol. So you basically get all the hardware support, um, but without whilst closing most, if not all, of the loopholes for replay attacks. So the only thing that an attacker could still do is A, mess with your um, correction fields. You can limit the impact of that, um, but you can never do better than uh, your round trip time on that. Uh, so that, that's your maximum error. Uh, that an attacker can still force since your ranch time. And the second part that an attacker can um, I'm trying to formulate my thoughts. Uh, still, an attacker can still drop server. messages, essentially. How about the server about the side? Server like, side? Do you have like, also like a the like uh, uh, PI controller, PI controller or something or like, like, like Linder egg, or, Linder egg something. or something. Um, so, like, um, so, so I'm treating NTP mostly as uh, we don't specify the server anymore. 
I see. Uh, so that's I up hear. to the implementer. Um, that seems to be the way that the NTP device pack is also moving uh, to make that explicit. It, there's really no realistic way to catch you if you do the NTPv4 spec that you're not standards compliant. And for the most part, people don't seem to care about you using a non standard compliant servo. Um, what we use specifically within the NTPD RS implementation is not a PI uh, setup. Uh, instead, we uh, to, to basically eliminate a lot of the tuning out of the equation, uh, we decided to approach this as a state estimation problem, which is where the common filter idea came from. I see. Uh, so instead, so th this comes fundamentally from a uh, different view of a clock. Uh, so we, or, or I should say, I tend to think about clocks not so much as a phase clock. Uh, loop thing that I can uh, continuously vary the frequency of. I tend to, and this maps better on most hardware, not all the hardware, but most hardware these days in computers. You have a counter that just ticks over uh, by one, basically every iteration of some uh, oscillator device that you that has a fixed frequency that you can you can't uh, directly influence. And then you apply a translation layer on top of this, on, on, on top of this count, to get from count to an actual timestamp. And once you got that picture, actually you can reformulate your problem as what's the best way to implement the translation. And then alongside that, once you've got that sort of ideal translation, you might want to smooth out the transitions between those ideal trans uh, translations a little bit just to make sure software doesn't get uh, confused by a clock jumping backwards and forwards uh, all over the place. But that then does not really become a problem anymore that you need a PI controller for. And it turns out that with a common filter, our experience has been that you can do the error estimates, which is basically the, the one thing you would need to tune. Uh, you can do those dynamically well enough that they don't. You don't need to do a priori tuning. The software can do that autonomously on its own. All right, all right. And there's a bunch of math uh, around the, the 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 assumptions you make there. Not all those assumptions hold. I'm not mathematically skilled enough to see and 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 truly understand why that's not too much of a problem, um, but it seems to uh, correlate with the general observation that for most applications, even if errors are not exactly Gaussian and not exactly matching yeah. uh, what a common filter needs, it tends to still perform fairly well. I, I'm wondering I, how the stationarity conditions are, uh, are uh, met in this. Met in this uh, I'd like to see I'd like them. to see them. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm planning to write a white paper on what we're doing, also as sort of a internal document, so that we can remember that for the future. And should I ever fall away from the project, that others can take over that work. Um, it should appear somewhere at the end of December, hopefully. Awesome. Within awesome. the pro project that that where I'm I'm planning to go into more of the details of what we're doing, how we're doing it. Uh, some of the numbers involved um, and what works for us in there. So if you're Great. interested in Great. that, uh, take I'm, a look I'm, at I'm, the NPDRS repository to the end of December. Hopefully it's in there. I yes. can also send yes. you an email if you want. Yes, yes, please. Yes, yes, please. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Any more let's questions? Any more Anybody? questions? Any All right. Hearing none, I can give you guys back... Uh, seven minutes i'm assuming so uh, the recording will be on the wiki as usual and david will send me the slides so we'll add them there and uh, we'll see everyone in uh, two weeks uh, by precision from avenue